Well, welcome to session number five, First Congress and the Bill of Rights. This is the second of three on the politics of the Bill of Rights. I realize that the distinction between the origin documentary origin of the Bill of Rights and the politics of the Bill of Rights is somewhat arbitrary, but I hope that you can see the difference. I mean, it's like the accumulation of documents from the Magna Carta through the Northwest Ordinance and the Constitutional Convention on the one hand, and then the rough and the tumble of democratic, poli democratic Republican politics in its early form as the Republic um, uh, sort of deals with what does it mean to secure rights. So this is the first Congress and the Bill of Rights. And the Constitution is ratified. Elections are to take place in the fall of 1780, um, 1788. And the government is to take effect in the new year, 17, 1789. And in his first inaugural, um, George Washington sets the tone. And the tone, as, as you can read here, he, 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 um, he addressed his compensation, which he declined. And then Congress's exercise of the occasional power delegated by the first article of the Constitution, namely the power to amend the Constitution. I think that should be fifth of article of the Constitution, the power to amend the Constitution. He asked that whilst you carefully avoid any alteration which might endanger the benefits of a united and effective government, a reverence for the characteristic rights of freemen will sufficiently influence your deliberations on the question how far the former can be impregnably fortified or the latter be safely and advantageously promoted. I mean, Madison could have written that. Or Madison's stuff, Washington could, Washington could have written it. The idea is, is, is the following challenge. Is it possible? to add a Bill of Rights to the existing Constitution without undermining the very work of the Constitutional Convention in creating the Constitution, as some members would have a mind to do by offering unfriendly amendments to the Constitution that would do precisely that, under, un, uh, undo the work of the, of the Convention. So this becomes the shall we say, the statesmanlike challenge. Um, and Washington takes the lead in the first inaugural. Similarly, we might see the, um, the, the Madison-Jefferson exchange. I was asked at the break uh, to, to sort of line people up. I mean, isn't it interesting that neither John Adams nor Thomas Jefferson were present at the convention? What difference would either of them their, their presence made. And I think that Jefferson's presence would probably have made a greater impact than, than John Adams' presence. Uh, the reason being is that John Adams' position was sufficiently covered by Rufus King and Nathaniel Gorham from Massachusetts, whereas I'm not so sure that Thomas Jefferson's position was adequately covered by a ticked-off George Mason and a, and a confused uh, Governor Randolph. But what is also very, very important is that, is that Madison was determined to keep Jefferson in France informed. <laughs> he kept, right, yes, really, he, he, yes, he was determined to keep him in France, but he was also <laughs> he, he, he determined to keep him informed in France. And J Jefferson wrote back to Madison uh, uh, at one time and said, now let me, now I, know I, I do like the Constitution. Now let me tell you what I don't like about the Constitution. It lacks the essential Bill of Rights. And there are three, there are th there are three rights that Jefferson um, says are essential that he would love to see some, some response to. It. And one is the right of conscience, and Madison would have no problem with that. I mean, he's the author of the, the, the last one in, on the, in, in the Virginia uh, State Constitu uh, uh, Declaration of Rights dealing with conscience. Um, you'd like to see something dealing with, um, with, with, with jury trials. So more dealing with jury trials, and, and Madison doesn't have a problem with that. And, um, and the other one is he wouldn't have a problem with is, is the, 
the right to the free press, which is the, known as the palladium of liberty. And it's called the palladium of liberty on the ground that, that if you have a free competitive press, um, then, you see, you see Madison is against monopoly. I, mean, I think that's extremely important to come back to. That, that um, a free competitive press, then politicians can't get away with things because they'll be, they'll be discovered. They'll be, uh, they'll be and, and plus, the press is the place where people can write opinion editorials. I mean, I guess it's hard to believe, but the, 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 the Federalist Papers were opinion editorial pieces. Um, at that time, and that, that was the, sort of the quality of the, of, of the writing. But the important point here is that Madison and Jefferson involved, were involved in an exchange of letters with each other at various stages, one during the convention, the, 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 the Philadelphia convention, secondly, during ratification, and thirdly, during the, the, during the first Congress. And at each of these stages, you can see that one is learning from the other. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful it, it set, of, uh, set of correspondence where they each learn from the other one. And M Madison sort of says, you know, ever since the beginning, I've been su suspicious about the efficacy of a Bill of Rights because they're just parchment barriers. I, I mean, I've been concerned about it. Jefferson says, listen, better to have it than not have it. Well, I'm not so sure. Um, well, why not? Well, what if I miss one? Well, better to, miss half, better to have half than miss, miss them all. And through this discussion and exchange, Madison actually comes up with um, a solution to what happens if you list and you're concerned about missing one. It is that the rights listed should not be interpreted as disparaging others held by the people. That, you won't find it in the English heritage, the colonial heritage, the revolutionary heritage, the, the, the continental heritage, anything. That comes from Madison's head, straight out of his head. So what comes to be called in our U.S. Bill of Rights, the Ninth Amendment, that's pure Madison. And, is, and it is critical as to what got him to shift become more in favor of a Bill of Rights than he had been earlier. And we will look in the, in the final session when we will look at, did Madison flip-flop? What, what, what are we to make of, um, what are we to make of Ma Ma Madison? Will the right James Madison please stand up? What's going on here? We will take a look at that in the last session. But you can see from his exchange with, with, with Jefferson that he, he, he says, there, there is a good prudential reason why I am in favor of a Bill of Rights. It, it might help. On the other hand, it might not help. Um, you know, as Jefferson says, sometimes it's better to be helpful than not helpful. But, but his main point is that uh, well, he, over, he overcame the danger because he's the, the enumeration. I've mentioned that. Uh, he says that there are honorable and patriotic opponents who want to revise the Constitution by including a Bill of Rights and defeating a call for the Second Convention which, that would abolish the Constitution. R Randolph's problem is that he played with fire. He wanted a Second Convention. Madison has got to stop that. Right? That becomes a danger. So now if you say, if, if, if you're, I mean, at one level it seems utilitarian and calculating. But at another level, it becomes sensible. I mean, what is the alternative? Is the alternative um, somebody like Randolph going off half cock, going across the country, calling for a second convention? I've got to stop that. How do I stop that? If it means trying to, uh, trying to divide the opposition in half, I'm going to do it. Well, that sounds like d politics to me. Of course. That's what politicians do. All right. So that he, um, uh, uh, so these are the two anticipatory uh, positions I want us to get. Washington lends his authority in the first inaugural address to his countrymen that a Bill of Rights is needed. And secondly, Madison takes the lead 
the father of the Constitution, so to speak, and says, I'm going to take charge with regard to bringing Jefferson on board, making sure he understands that we are in this disposition. So now what we want to do then is, having anticipated the task of the First Congress as set by President Washington, and the task of the First Congress has taken up by Representative James Madison. By the way, the, the, Senate, the, the, the um, senators, U.S. senators, were selected by the state legislatures at, at that time. And the Virginia uh, state legislature refused to select James Madison as its, as its U.S. senator. And the reason being is that um, he couldn't be trusted. Um, well, that's, that's not the first nor the last um, statement concerning the trust of James Madison by others in, in, in his lifetime. All right, so let's move to the first Congress. And one um, way to try to track the debates in the first Congress is to divide them into five dimensions. And dimension number one is Madison's speech proposing amendments to the Constitution. This is his famous June the 8th speech in which he virtually summarizes his exchange with Jefferson and says that I have come, I've, I've come around to the position that a Bill of Rights is neither unnecessary nor dangerous if, if handled properly. So I want us to have uh, pay attention, but that by the end of the first session of the first Congress, I want a Bill of Rights. And uh, people say, oh, come on, we have to set up a treasury. We have, have, we have a Judiciary Act to do. We have a War Department to fund. But, but this idea of a Bill of Rights, the people have voted. The Anti-Federalists lost. Why don't we get on with the business of governing? And Madison, I think, his answer is, but the founding is incomplete. Without a Bill of Rights, the, the job we set out to do is not yet done. And again, the yawns and whatnot, and, and you can read the, the letters, and somebody says, you know, Madison, he's just possessed. He dreams about anti-federalism in his, in his waking hours. He dreams about them in his sleeping hours. He sleepwalks anti-federalism. It's sort of the specter of anti-federalism is haunting his very life. Um, but he gets his way to, to, to introduce, introduce his proposals. And, and what I have done is to show you in that in the, the end of that first dimension, um, at the end of June, the, the, is at the end of this June eighth speech, and moving to the, to um, oops, um, this one the proposal integrated into the Constitution. We can't get that yet. All right. Well, what we want to do is to show what Madison had in mind, when he, with, 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 with his proposals. Um, Right, well, this is his speech, and then if we go to the, the other one, yeah, Madison's proposals integrated. That's it. Um, I'll, I'll bring it up this time. Keep, keep, uh, keep filibustering, because <laughs> I can't get too, he too far ahead of myself, because if I get too far ahead of myself, then I can't go back, right? Because uh, I'll have to bring my cot out and sit down and lay on it and figure out what am I doing here by filibustering <laughs> the 60 votes there. All right, Madison spoke. And he, he, and he came up with essentially 39 rights. Where did he get these 39 rights from? Most of them came from the Virginia and New York ratifying convention Bill of Rights, not amendments, but, but um, the, the Bill of Rights from, from proposals from, from those areas. And then that, that meant that he had to make a decision. What would he like to do? What was the tradition in America about stating rights? Uh, thing one was to have a prefatory. Uh, that's what George Mason was prepared to do in the, 
when he was at the Constitutional Convention on September the 12th, he said, let's, let's have a prefatory Bill of Rights. Uh, Virginia will help us. The other suggestion that had been done by four states in America was that you, you sort of intertwine them into the body of the Constitution itself. Uh, what Madison decided to do was to intertwine them in the body of the Constitution. And so what I've shown in this Madison's proposals integrated into the Constitution is just that. What would they look like if Madison had his way? What would they look like? Well, what happens is that Madison gives his speech, he shows what he would like, and what the uh, House does is to, to create a select committee. And this select committee looks at the, um, the, the June 8th speech and, and his proposals from July the 21st to July the 28th. The report of the House Select Committee emerges. The House sent Madison's proposals um, and, 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 it, and it, produced, all right, it, it produces this report. The important part about this report is that it cuts Madison's um, suggestions concerning um, concerning the preamble to the Constitution. It, it cuts that uh, to, um, oh, you are so good. <laughs> All right, now, the first proposal has three sections. See, what we will land up with is 39, but proposal number one has three parts. That may be predicate, prefixed to the Constitution, a declaration. All powers originally vested in it and constantly derived from the people. The government is instituted by right, etc. The people, the, the, the people, have, have, have an indiv inhabitable, yes. Uh, the first three points there are your in inherent rights doctrine, your natural rights doctrine. So Madison says, all right, we've got the Declaration of Independence, we've got the Virginia uh, Bill of Rights, and they all start off with these three features of inherent or natural rights. Purpose of government, legitimate government, and the, and the range of government, okay? And consent. So just to make matters complicated, Madison, in his June 8th speech, calls these first, uh, he says, the first, th th these three here, relates to what may be called a Bill of Rights. That just stirs it up, okay? I, 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 I'm just showing you how, how there's no one way for a declaration, a bill, and this, that, and the other, what is a Bill of Rights? But those three he would call a Bill of Rights. And if they're incorporated in the Constitution, independent tribunals of justice will consider themselves in a peculiar manner the guardians of those rights. Okay, so what did he want to do? He wanted to add those three to the preamble. Why? That would silence for all time that there was a distinction, a fundamental difference between the objectives of the Declaration of Independence and the preamble to the Constitution. You put both together and you have ended for all time in the future somebody saying the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution are not in harmony. Okay. The select committee said no. Cut it. So that goes three of the 39. Why? Why would they say so? And the answer is we have the declaration, it does its job. We have the preamble, it does its job. Don't muck around. They're perfectly fine, thank you. Can we move on? So what Madison does is say, he says, he's just, he, he takes his fellow delegates by the hand. He says, right, let's take Article 1, Section 1. Is there anything I want to do there? No. How about Article 1, Section 2? Yes. That what I'm going to do is in Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3, the number of representatives shall not exceed one for every such and such and one. I want to be, I've listened to the anti federalists They have told me, and I've listened to them, they've told me that starting off with one for 65,000, one representative for 65,000 is not good enough. We want one, we're going to get as close as possible to one to 30,000. That's in the Constitution. But the anti federalists are saying, Today, one to 65,000, you never know. 2013, one for 650,000. 
And Madison is saying, I don't want that to happen. So I want, I want it written in Article 1, Section 2, right where it says 1 to 30,000. I want to say, we mean it. We seriously mean this. And this is how I want it to read. All right. So what else? He says, let me continue now. You know, he can, let me, he flick his, puts his drink turn the page. The Senate, I don't need to do anything there. The Senate is one, each state two votes. So I just keep going. How about Article 1, Section 4? Now, I don't need anything there. How about Article 1, Section 5? Um, no. Article 1, Section 6. Aha. The Anti-Federalists have proposed that it's, it's a bit unseemly, a conflict of interest, that the president can't have the pay increase until facing the voters. Judges can't have their uh, pay cut. But Congress can do whatever the heck it wants to do with its pay. The anti-federalists say, why don't we say the same thing for the Congress as to the president? That is, they cannot achieve an increase in pay until they meet the voters. And I would love to put that in right, right here, because that's where it fits. Right there. And he says, oh, it's all right, so I'm going to move on. Article, nothing to do with Section 7, that's how a bill becomes a law. Nothing to do with 8, because that's the powers. Now I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop at Article 1, Section 9, because that is precisely where a Bill of Rights should appear. Right after I've listed the powers, this is where I'm going to list the rights. And there are rights there already. So this is what I want to add, says Madison. That in the Article, Section 1, between 3 and 4, be inserted these. Civil rights of none shall be abridged on accounts of religious belief of worship, nor shall any national religion be established, nor shall the full of equal rights of conscience be any man. Look, look at them. Uh, he keeps going down. 7, 8, 9, 10, <coughs> 17. 17 of the 39 of Madison's proposals are right in Article 1, Section 9. Surprise? No. Why not? Because that's exactly what we've been, been sort of prepared to accept, that, to, to, to understand. Well, how about um, in all criminal prosecutions, the accused compulsory process of witness, exceptions here or elsewhere in the Constitution, editor's note spends virtually no time defending or explaining this. He goes on and on and then on. Then he moves to section 10. Now, all of those things are in there. Then he goes to fifth proposal, one, two, three, and, and, and um, and this is, Ma this is one of Madison's terrific proposals, namely that if Jefferson is correct, that conscience, press, and jury in criminal cases are important to limit against the federal government, we should also limit them against state governments. And uh, so, so you have the symmetry. Article 1, Section 9, no titles of nobility, federal. Section 10, no titles of nobility, federal, a state. So you've got this symmetry. So he says, fine, let's do the same thing, symmetry with regard to conscience, jury trial, in criminal cases, and freedom of the press. And then he, go, he goes on, and not, nothing to do with Article 2, not, no changes in Article 2, no changes in, 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 in Article 3. There's, you know, Article 3, there's a, as a, there's a, a change, um, a, a change right there at the end of, of the uh, of Article Three, but let's go straight to let's go straight to the end and and wh where we see that Madison is willing to have the powers delegated by the Constitution appropriate to the department. That separation of powers. Uh, that's a, that's a request by the Anti-Federalists. That we state we mean the separation of powers. A number and then the powers not delegated by this Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively. So he then says, let's close up the document. There are 39 proposals in here. I propose that we open the document, begin at the preamble, fill in what we want, close it up again, send it out for ratification, and we start afresh. That the, that the, the, the founding is complete. The first Congress is, in fact, the second convention. We've satisfied the, uh, the, the, the good folks who, are who have these objections. 
and we move on. Okay, and I hope that what I've shown you through incorporating indicates what it is that Madison wanted to do. Well, let us return to the, um, to, to, to the, di to, yes, to this. So the, the second dimension is that the House comes out with a select report. Dimension three, the House version. Well, what the House does is the following, and this is just, it's, just um, it's really amazing. They debate whether to follow Madison's suggestion of incorporation. And Sherman, Roger Sherman, who has this capacity to appear in all various places with, he's, he's not a household name, but he just, he's, he's all over the place. And he's Madison's nemesis throughout. And Sherman says, I object to opening up the Constitution and putting these 39 changes in there. The work of the framers should never be sullied. And can't you see Madison saying, but I am the framer. <laughs> That's what you think, says Mr. Sherman. Oh, something like that. And Sherman wins, which means Madison loses. So what happens? The best I can figure out is that a clerk is requested to take Madison's proposals and take them out from whence he put them and now bundle them in a different form as 17 separate amendments to the Constitution. One more time. Sherman wins. He says, I don't want anything to be done to touch the Constitution so that the Bill of Rights, which we're talking about, must appear as amendments. But amendments, says Madison, are different than a Bill of Rights. Sorry, says Sherman, this is how they're going to appear, because we cannot touch the work of the framers. You're playing with fire, says Madison. Oh, no, I'm not. I am honoring the work of the framers. So they have to go on the outside. Well, what order they go in? And the answer is the order that they appeared in Madison's suggestion. But at that time, they had a purpose and a coherence to them. Now when you pull them out, they don't have an order and coherence to them. And now you've bundled them together as 17, each with a, a certain number. And now you send, so now these have to go to the Senate. When they go to the Senate, the Senate alters it to 12 by condensing and by eliminating. What do you think the Senate eliminates? It eliminates the restraints on the states. The Senate is the state's branch. Bye-bye Senate constraint on uh, 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 the, the, the Madison's proposal to restrain the states with conscience, jury, trial on criminal cases, and free press. Gone. So that cuts that down. Bam, we're down from 39 now to something in the order of 30, 33, and then, we, and then what, we ha what happens is that, is that you've got consolidating. They go back, so like, like a bill becomes a law today, you've got a House version and you've got a Senate version. Remember, each version has to get a two-thirds vote of the House, a two-thirds vote of the Senate. For an amendment to become an amendment, you have to have two-thirds, two-thirds, and then three-quarters of the state legislatures. Two-thirds, two-thirds, by, uh, 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 so they have to have a House Conference Committee to iron out the differences between the House, a House-Senate Conference Committee to iron out the, the differences between a House version and a Senate version. And they're negotiating right to the end. Madison gets himself on the House Conference Committee. And he manages to alter some, something right at the end. That's the version that's signed by Congress. This House-Senate House Conference Committee is signed, signed by Congress in September 1789. In fact, it would be what a, a, a wonderful um, one week, sort of one week of, of, of great constitutional founding politics if we could 
if we could honor the, the Constitution on September the 17th and honor the Bill of Rights on September the 25th, that would have one concentrated week. Instead, what happens is that we tend to honor the Bill of Rights in December when school is out or exams are on, and thus you don't get to do the Bill of Rights in the same way. So I would recommend uh, that uh, you, you at least explore that uh, th that way. And I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you why um, in, in, in a minute if I don't forget. Uh, um, so the conference committee does it and it goes forward. Now that's, um, what we have done in this session is how come the Bill of Rights appears at the end of the Constitution when in fact what we have been used to is the Bill of Rights appearing at the beginning as a preface, declaration, or inside a document. But it appears at the end. And it appears at the end as amendments. Whereas amendments are considered to be alterations and not a Bill of Rights. I hope I have explained that um, peculiarity of why the Bill of Rights appears at the end and, and, as, and as, as amendments rather than as beginnings or in the middles. Um, now, the reason why I, before I, so I don't forget, um, three quarters of the states you would think is nine out of 13 again the same number it took to ratify. But the, the Constitution should be taken to ratify an amendment. But in the meantime, in the time it took for, um, uh, for, the, Constitu for, 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 the, for the Bill of Rights to be ratified, um, December 1791, that's two years, um, Vermont joined. So instead of nine out of 13, uh, you needed 10 out of 14. And, um, and three states didn't ratify. And the three states that did, uh, three states that there were, one was Massachusetts, and the second was Connecticut, the third was Georgia, and they didn't ratify until September 1939, which was the 150th anniversary of, con of Congress signing the Bill of Rights. So if we want to, we could do Congress, I mean the Con Constitutional Convention signing the Constitution, September the 17th, Congress signing the Bill of Rights, September the 25th, and, uh, and, and, and have a good old uh, autumn, fall uh, slog at uh, to have one whole week at constitutional politics for, uh, with the articles, with, excuse me, with the Constitution and the Bill of Rights together in one week. Um, Anthony? Some yeah, got, uh, got some 10 minutes to, to handle some handle questions. Yes, sir. Originally, if Article 5 says you need the three quarters of the states to agree to a, uh, an amendment, um, you'd need 10 out of 13, correct? If you add a 14th, you need 11 out of 14. And um, I know we're not... We're yeah, not yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and we could look, but why, why, why don't we go to, um, Lisa, why don't we go to... Um, that main page on the Bill of Rights site, and we get go out of debates, and we go to this diagram, part three, I think it's that one. Let's see where we're going to go. Uh, adoption of the Ten Amendments. Right. Yes, 12, yeah. Massachusetts, Georgia, Connecticut, uh, 1939. Virginia was 11. Yes, so you need 11 out of 14. That is correct. Out, out of um, those 14 states, um, 
obviously some of them said we'll approve 10 of them but not the other two and um, all right I'm, I'm not sure did did everybody reject the other two no okay. no no we can show um, do we have that table up there since Jefferson's hand I, I also I think maybe Lisa it will be easier to read if we if we go into my handwriting, is it, um, right here, let's focus on political arithmetic. I sure wish there were documents available, but we don't have these. So, so let's start at the end. Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Georgia didn't even bother to chat and deliberate. So here we have three states who don't think a Bill of Rights is important enough to even bother. So again, in terms of political arithmetic, since three states have in effect voted no to every one of the 12 amendments, Right? By not showing that, that means a no vote to all 12. By the way, 12 amendments go forward. This is what you need to realize. Right? 12 amendments go forward. So what is the first amendment? The census. What is the second amendment? The pay of Congress. What is the third amendment? Free speech, free press, etc. Um, what is the fourth amendment? Right to bear arms. The... Um, Unanimity over all 12 amendments did not occur. And the first and second amendments went down to defeat. Two states voted no on the first amendment, and four states voted no on the second amendment. Given the political arithmetic, we know that 11 states voted yes on all the others. Yeah, I mean, get, right? It, it, they had to. If, if, uh, if one state voted no, it would have gone down to defeat because three voted, didn't bother to show up to vote. So that page might help. Um, again, why, why did it take so long for Virginia to ratify? And the answer is that that was the last bastion of anti-federalism. They were the ones who held out for amendments, not Bill of Rights. So what did they get? <laughs> A Bill of Rights is amendments, which they didn't like. I hope that, I hope, you know, that is extremely important to understand, and I hope that, that this has been clear enough to, 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 to capture that distinction. Yes. Yes, no, I'm talking to you. Well, I'm waiting for the microphone. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> boy, you are, I tell you. you. Uh, yes, so sir. we're making a distinction between... Um, changing the Constitution, an amendment, and then the furthering of people's rights. I just had a quick little opinion question on your part. Which of those amendments do you really think further the people's rights out of the 10? All right, so now we've, we're not dealing with the first issue, right? We're dealing with now we've got, we, have, we have a Bill of Rights now as 10 amendments to the Constitution. Right. Which of those further the... The people's rights the, the most. Yeah, in your opinion. In my opinion, is the first, which became known as the First Amendment, which contains six. Religion, religion 1A and B, press and, press and speech 1, 2A and B, and, and then assembly and petition. But I think at the core of that is conscience. And funny, conscience disappears. If we were to... I think we'll leave that till the, till, till the, uh, to the last session to... To, sh to show that uh, box score, but that, um, that I, I, want, I, I want to show you what I, what I want to show you is what happens to the 39, how, the fate of Madison's proposals. And why does the 39 become 26? And what changes takes place in language and, and terms of and priorities? Yes, that's uh, that's very good. What if someone makes an argument that the Ninth Amendment is the most important because it allowed the courts to add more privileges, abortion, maybe even gay rights in the future? Well, what, and what is your question? Would, that, would somebody make an argument that eventually the Ninth Amendment is really more important than the first 
amendment. Well, one, one, okay, one might make that argument, and I can see Madison being interested in that because he was the one who came up with it. And he thought that saved the Bill of Rights, okay? But, but for a reason different than the one you offered. If we take a look at the language of the, of the Ninth Amendment, it says, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. The implication, well, as I read that, is that you're not going to, it's, it, others, it, it doesn't say or disparage others invented by the court. It implies that, it, that, 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 that the people do have them, but we just haven't listed them. But please do not interpret the non-listing to mean they don't have them. I mean, well, what that indicates is the problem of listing. And you know it with your students, you know it with your children, you know it with your parents. Um, how do you interpret silence? Does silence say means you can or does silence mean you, means you can't? Uh, that you, silence, does silence mean you have or silence mean you don't have? And I, I thought really bothered Madison. Um, and, and I say the flip side is how about listing powers? I mean, for example, nowhere in Article 1, Section 8 explicitly does it say that, that Congress shall pass a health care law. But it doesn't say that anywhere where it says that Congress can't pass a health care law. So what do you do? I mean, how do you, is a, consti is a Constitution supposed to empower or restrain? Or is it supposed to do a bit of both? And, uh, and, and then, it, it, are there some, is, are there, are some modes of interpretation uh, more lucid than others, more defensible than others? And here, here's, the, I mean, it, here's, here's the irony or the dilemma or the paradox of a Bill of Rights. We feel more secure by writing things down. Why? What if, what, I mean, the, 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 the British have an unwritten constitution, except that we looked at three things that were written down, <laughs> right? Um, but but um, I know that uh, from, in, in families, things are written on the, uh, on the uh, refrigerator, <laughs> right? Well, I wrote it down. So I, 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 I see the point, I see your point. Madison would see your point, that, that if we were to take a look at the, at, uh, at, uh, uh, trying to estimate where Article 9 came from. I mean, if, uh, Lisa, if we went right back to the origins, uh, right back to the, to the lead page, and we went in and we did, uh, yes. Now what this does is say uh, am amendment, so say like amendment number nine. You number, and we, we click on that, um, we click, click on that. It's not working, okay. Uh, but if we did that, you, you'd only find one entry. And that would be uh, Madison, if, right, or probably not at all, Lisa. That just, why don't we see Amendment Number Four, uh, Amendment Number One, a minute? Right. That go no establishment. Right. The state constitution origins. There you go. So if you want to know where to find the no establishment clause in all the documents that we've been looking at, there are four of them right there. If you wanted to say freedom of press. You click on freedom of press, right? And you say, how about English and colonial origins? Is there anything there? Yes, one, the Massachusetts Body of Liberties. That's, okay? So if we were to do, um, again, amendment, amendment number nine, the, 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 there is none. There is no precedent. And the reason is it comes from Madison's brain. And it's not an invitation to create rights. It's a security, lest we forget to list one. I mean, I'll give you an example. 
Declaration of Independence says that the um, that we are endowed by our Creator with certain with certain and un un unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then on to other matters. Couldn't you give us another couple? I mean, would it really hurt you, Jefferson, to say right to travel, right to privacy? I mean, does it really? Why did you have to stop at three? I mean, it's clearly there are others. But your language indicates there are others. Let's, uh, let's stop there for this session. We'll take one last break as uh, we, uh, we get some water and bananas for the marathon that uh, Professor Lloyd is running today. Uh, but yeah, we'll be back in about 12 minutes.